you so much for coming to hear us today. We present to you orthorexia and anorexia, a study in similarity. And our research question, can orthorexia be considered an early stage of anorexia or be added to the anorexic spectrum? I'm actually going to celebrate your birthday with friends, but not really being able to enjoy it. Um, an hour before the party, if you sit and you stare at yourself in the mirror, you're incredibly, incredibly insecure. Uh-oh. At dinner, you and your friends laugh about whatever they want, and they're talking about, like, pretty much, they're just having fun. And then you suddenly look over in front of you, and you see an empty plate and a glass of water, and you're trapped in your bag of thoughts. That's how someone suffers from interaction with those on a basis. Eating disorders are essentially something that you can play with. But the goal of this presentation is to combat that. Both are actually and 
complexity treatment for anorexia is not always direct or affected. Uh, anorexia negatively distorts how a person views their own body, which can have harmful effects on their mental health. Many people could suggest that the yielded results of the motor 
there are a few possible errors with this study. First of all, it's or having to do with the diagnosis. First, orthorexia is not actually an official diagnosis, so it's hard to um, find and diagnose the patient as there aren't as many like diagnostic symptoms that are set out. Um, second, the lack of information that gives the chance for the participant may be orthorexic, for example, since basic people orthorexia presents as some of the like, the, like the regular weight or overweight, um, they may be misdiagnosed as orthorexic and they may have that for two Um, so there's also obviously going to be a few other liberal social implications to consider. First, participants would be prohibited from being on medications during the experiment due to the necessity of examining the brain in an unaltered state for the sake of comparison. And this requirement could obviously have negative impacts because it may cause a regression in whatever condition that the patient's meds come um, But a more positive implication is that whether or not the trial finds similarities between cognitive function related to anorexia and orthorexia, it will enhance the knowledge about orthorexia. And if results show similarities in the And the issue there is that the, the, the rexia aspect of it doesn't necessarily put it on the spectrum, but rather what it does is it, it, it grounds orthorexia to a construct of eating spectrum conditions. So your, your work is, I think, very, very well done. One of the things that can very easily happen, though, is something called construct dissonance. In other words, the constructs don't quite line up, and are you sort of trying to... Okay. The other thing that happens is the nature of the tool. So looking at some of the cerebellar effects, the problem with that is that they're really due to some of the metabolic effects of anorexia, not the causative effects. So they may not, here, this is a question, does the tool actually make it to the task? That said, this happens all the time in research. So what you have to do is go through the short list of tools and go, is this the right one, is that the right one? So like anything else, a screw looks at also a lot like a nail. Do you use a screwdriver or do you use a hammer? And it's just a simple question of refinement. Because if the job is to build a perfect house, that's what you're trying to do. So congratulations on that. A little bit of tweaking makes a very, very good approach an excellent one. So good job. Rachel, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, you guys, the, the, I thought that the idea of the spectrum considerations and trying to place orthorexia on the spectrum was a really genius idea. Um, I noticed that you were, um, there's something implicit in comparing um, atypical anorexia to underweight anorexia and healthy controls. Um, I know just from working with you that your, your goal was to use those conditions to control for the metabolic effects. And the idea was to look for a cognitive function um, that is 
And I think I heard this from you guys, that the cognitive function is abnormal in both underweight and atypical anorexics. Um, and you want, and then so um, that said, I think that that got a little bit lost in the way that, that you set up the presentation. Um, so highlighting that might have actually addressed some of what Dr. Giordano's concerns were. And, um, and you know, I wanted to hear a little bit more about why this motor function. You did say a little bit that there are cognitive functions that have identified the cerebellum as a significant, you know, area, but that kind of needed to be made more explicit because otherwise it comes, it, the, the takeaway is that you're looking at motor functions, which of course are more affected by metabolics. And the cerebellum is likely to be more um, impacted specifically by metabolics than, than other parts of the brain. So um, the idea is brilliant. And in a lot of ways, the execution and the setup of it is very good. Um, the selection of just which, which assay, um, there might have been a better one. Um, and, um, you know, I think just a little thing, just setting up the background by introducing the constructs before talking about the experiment might have also kind of added to the clarity. But basically what you have is, is you have a really complex idea that you have all the elements in this. Like you picked all the elements, you thought them through, I can tell. Um, so you're like 90% of the way there. And this is the kind of um, presentation that if I were mentoring a group or mentoring somebody, I would absolutely say this is an idea that could be funded. Let's refine this just a little bit further. Um, but the basic skills that we want to see, you know, that you guys really excelled in. You linked things together. You thought through how to set this up. And you really did a really, really good job with that. And I really think you should be really proud of yourself. Professor Shook? Dealing with constructs is difficult. And there's no way other than to just plow kind of through it and see what sticks. What you're doing is uh, you're looking at 12 to 20 year olds, which gives you an opportunity to somehow help refine the construct along the way. For example, if it is a genuine personality obsession with purity, there ought to be independent testing that you could put uh, your uh, orth orthorexic folks through to find out if you've got a personality twerk that's just taking the consumption opportunity and then it looks like a food eating disorder. But actually, it's a purity disgust thing mm -hmm. that's going on deeper. Mm -hmm. But your experiment would be able to tease this out. Similarly, test them for body image distortions or other sorts of things that you can independently test. That way, the more you know about these uh, young adults, the more valid the experimental uh, result. This doesn't affect the interest, of course, in your study. But there are some tweaks, some preps. Uh, I see some staging, maybe that uh, get, lends more con uh, confidence in the constructs. But uh, terrific effort here, terrific effort. We're all, we're all a buzz because yeah. we're, we're excited about this yeah. kind of research, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No, I, mean, I, I think it actually has very strong translational value to so say, look, you know, where, do, where do we place anorexia on that spectrum of eating conditions? What's a condition, what's a state, what's a disorder? What's order mm -hmm. and disorder, what we talked about? It's spot on. Faye, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think from the clinical standpoint, it, the more we know about the brain, the, the more we start to understand that there are certain conditions that are starting to become separate than the conditions that we traditionally thought were, could be lumped together. And so I think it's really important for us to ask, how is orthorexia different from these other disordered eating patterns? How can we put that on a certain spectrum diagnostically? I think bringing up the, the DSM and how that has progressed throughout the years is really important because it shows how we need to keep up with the times of how, if our knowledge increases, so do the spectrums of um, disordered behavior uh, that we define. So I thought, I thought that was really interesting. Um, the only critique I have is that maybe for the audience members like myself who don't entirely know what orthorexia is or have a background in orthorexia, maybe just define that a little bit earlier on so that as you're developing and, and creating your hypothesis and your key points, um, people will know kind of what, what disorder you are talking about. Um, but that's my only critique. It was, it was really wonderful to, to sit and learn from you guys. Ms. Leva, take them over the fence. Yeah, so I don't have any other 
feedback to add other than thank you for highlighting a really, really important topic. This is something that resonates with me personally. And so I just want to say thank you. I think you're on the right path and just a little bit of tweaking. And I think you're right there. Great job. Good job. Yeah.